You are a professor emeritus of natural resources and ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona. You have a blog called Nature Bats Last. That's correct. And you can find the blog at guymcpherson.com. And even if you spell it incorrectly, I think it's probably the first or second thing that pops up. And you've just finished a four and a half week tour. Yes, it was a speaking tour that started in Alaska and went to the San Francisco Bay Area in California and then back up the coast to Portland, Oregon, just back about a week ago. It was quite an exhausting adventure. Interesting. Yeah, I was trying to catch up some of the videos. I saw the one in Alaska. Yes, my partner is a professional videographer and Pauline records and edits and uploads. And obviously in the midst of the tour, it's difficult to keep up with all that's going on. So there's, there'll be quite a backlog. She just posted the first one from Juneau, Alaska, which is the second stop on the speaking tour. So she's still got a few weeks of editing ahead of her. Okay. Well, it's, it's helpful to have a podcast do that. Well, yes, especially considering how relatively few people show up for the events in person so there's a lot going on in everybody's lives and when we were in Juneau they were having their big annual festival so everybody was out partying they don't want to come get bad news at a public library so we'll manage to reach several thousand more people online than we ever could in person as long as we have this sort of connection we will be able to get that information you know and and you're internal conflict with living in Dubai and now in Sweden and I live in the United States having lived in Belize basically a third world country for, for about two and a half years I understand the conflict you know if you live in any first world country you're you're forced to have a large environmental footprint no matter what you do Every time you go into a grocery store, the temperature is set at an unbelievably low level, so they don't have to set the, so they don't have to spend even more money cooling the items in the freezer. Yeah. And in the United States, of course, we have the world's most expensive killing force, the military. And I, it doesn't matter how I vote, it doesn't matter what I buy, I'm still stuck with this incredibly expensive environmental footprint associated with having the military on quote my side yeah. uh, defending my freedom so you know we were all born into this set of living arrangements we didn't have any control over that what are you going to do i tried living outside of the country for a while it didn't work out yeah oh yeah absolutely and i think it gets more and more complex i mean no matter how you try to deconstruct the way you live or try to change your lifestyle or your habit i think somehow at least i find it's never enough well, the more the more you know, the more conflict arises. Yeah. Right. I mean, the more you study, the ignorance is truly bliss. That's all there is to it. The more you study the issue of your environmental footprint and abrupt climate change and ten thousand other factors associated with this this set of living arrangements, the more you realize there's no a couple of things. There's no one correct way to live, and there's almost nothing that an individual can do to turn this thing around. You know, I lived off grid for a decade and defecated in a bucket, literally, and took all those changes that I thought were important. And then, then you learn about the aerosol masking effect and you realize how little impact you're having on anybody's life in living that way, except your own. And so, I don't feel any particular shame or guilt associated with moving back to the country of my birth. It is what it is. There's very little I or anybody else can do about it. We're stuck here. Yeah, you know, I moved to the wilds of New Mexico in a very rural location, having spent 21 years as a professor. And I was very successful by any measure of academic success. I just assumed a whole bunch of people would follow me. Yeah. <laughs> what a joke. 
So, so nobody followed me. Yeah. And if they had, it would have been an unmitigated disaster because of the loss of global dimming associated with the loss of the Earth's fall masking effect. Or those are synonymous, really. But had everybody gotten off of the fossil fuel bandwagon at the same time I did, I guarantee you we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Yeah. You know, you know, so you so know. that's what I mean when it's you. We're just we're embedded within the system, and thinking about it seriously causes a lot of in, internal conflict. And it appears to me that there's no right way to deal with it because I tried taking this right path that cost me essentially every relationship in my life, and a, a lot of money and a lot of privilege. And what did it gain? Nothing, nothing really that I can tell. There was no measurable impact on anybody, there was, except me and the relationships in my life. So I just don't think it's a, I don't think we need to be embarrassed or ashamed or, or display any particular emotion based on the way we live. Because we were born in this, does that mean we can't do things? No, of course we can still do things. And I mean, huge fan of taking action but I think for the most part those actions have got to be within your own personal life with your family and friends and the relatively small circle of people you interact with every day yeah. beyond that forget about changing the Pentagon forget about changing the United Nations environmental program forget about all that it's strange you say that I mean I, I believe activism starts at home so I and it's or maybe actually even starts with yourself first so you really have to like sort of fight with yourself for that Right. And and I don't know, and I don't think there's any one right answer. As you indicated, activism starts with you in your own body, in your own brain, in your own heart, and extends to your family first. And as with all your relationships, the ones that are closest to you are the most important to you, and that's where you can have the most impact. And so for me, it turned out to be a terrible mistake moving off grid because of the loss of relationships, because of the loss of my ability to reach more people. Had I stayed in active service at the major university where I was conducting research and teaching, I would have been able, able to reach far more people. For example, I could fund my own speaking tours. I was making a lot of money. Now I rely upon the generosity of posts and organizers and donations from people just to get me from one place to another. And so there's there's no one simple correct answer. And and I think we have those of us who have lived within industrial civilization, which is almost everybody on the planet at this point, have come to believe that there's one way to live. That that for the most part you go to school, you go to school some more, you fall in love, you get married, you have 2.5 children, you jump on the treadmill, you work hard, thinking you're making a difference in the world until you're a certain age, 60 or 65 or whatever. And then you think about, maybe it's time for me to have fun. Maybe it's time for me to retire and do these things I see other elderly people are doing. And there's not one way to live, obviously. There are many alternative routes to that path. And I just don't see a lot of people thinking about those alternative routes. I don't see a lot of people making the move back to a simpler existence or maybe even forward to a simpler existence, which people tend to think of as moving backwards. But there, there's still a lot of wisdom in Henry David Thoreau's words, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I, if he was into simplicity so much, I don't know why he had to say it three times, but whatever. Yeah. What are your thoughts as change makers? Do you think we should all sort of jump on that bandwagon? And oh, what do you think of hope? Because I know you have some strong views on that. Yeah. Yes, I do have some strong views on hope. I think it's a bad idea. I think it's always been a bad idea. And I think it's one of those things that living within this set of living arrangement within industrial civilization, we are we are informed, it just becomes an assumption that hope is a good thing. Right. But that's for people who haven't looked at the definition, who don't actually know what it means. And in terms of Extinction Rebellion or any other movement, 
I'm a, I'm a huge fan of rebellion. Ask my parents. I've been rebelling my entire life. And it, it has become part of who I am. I'm not, in contrast, I'm not as much of an activist as a lot of people around me. I'm not the person who goes and stands on the street, street corner with a sign saying, do this and do that. My activism comes through my teaching and hopefully through the facilitated learning of people who are interested. So there's a lot here. And again, I think that we should be true to ourselves to be as authentic as we can possibly be, to be kind and compassionate and follow our own path and not be too concerned about what other people think of us. After all, it's adhering to the expectations of others for the most part that got us into this mess. It's everybody following the same path and us jumping along onto the bandwagon that got us into this mess. It's 7.7 .7 billion people wanting more of everything, wanting more attention, wanting more power, wanting more money, wanting more relationships on and on the list goes. So I guess I would propose a little introspection before jumping onto any particular activist movement. And with respect to Extinction Rebellion, I, I still am confused about what they have in mind. I, I certainly support the notion of informing people, and they've been very good at that, informing people that human extinction is nigh However, the actions they propose are either nonsensical or contrary to the goal of preventing human extinction. So they, they propose, for example, reducing industrial activity, which now that we know about the aerosol masking effect, we have to conclude that that's a really bad idea for us and for every other species on Earth. If you want to really ratchet up the rate of heating of planet Earth. Stop industrial activity. That'll do the job. The planet will heat up catastrophically quickly in a matter of days or weeks. And as a consequence, that's the quickest path to extinction of our species and a lot of others. So I encourage people to be thoughtful. If after thinking, if after introspection, you want to raise awareness, you want to go out and either party or rebel in the streets, you want to get the word out to the maximum extent possible, please do. You know, but, but be informed about it as you go. What I see the leaders of Extinction Rebellion doing is lying to people by omission of the aerosol masking effect. And so whereas I agree that bringing attention to this issue is a great idea. I don't agree with going halfway, with, with telling part of the truth, but only part of the truth, and thereby encouraging people to take actions that are kind of cause our extinction even faster. So it's a mixed bag. Obviously, no one's going to gonna shut down all our dependencies. It's not gonna just vanish in a day. But don't you think progressively maybe this could be I don't know how the aerosol masking, uh, how much time it takes to get into effect, but is there some kind of a science or some kind of a, uh, an approach that uh, here's something where we clearly define that we are wrong and maybe we need to relook at our own principles uh, or the ide ideologies that we are preaching for and we try to you know, shift our own um, sort of game in this, this arena. Yeah, I would, I would love to see some evidence for that. I haven't so far. Mm. For, for example, the aerosols that provide the masking are produced in the atmosphere through industrial activity. It's that same industrial activity that produces the greenhouse gases that most people know about. The greenhouse gases heat the earth and the temperature associated with the current level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse gas most people are most aware of. The heating associated with carbon dioxide currently in the air is locked in for at least the next thousand years. In contrast, if we reduce industrial activity, those aerosols fall out of the atmosphere in a matter of 
somewhere between five days and six weeks, depending on whether your authority is James Hansen in the former case or the con consensus among climate scientists in the latter case. Somewhere between five days and six weeks, the aerosols fall out of the sky and very abrupt heating follows. Wow. So if we even slow industrial activity, we don't need to stop it altogether. If we would slow it, those aerosols start falling out of the sky and we lose the, the mirror or the umbrella that prevents incoming solar radiation to heat the earth to begin with. I don't know any way around that. I'm a huge fan. I had an engineer contact me a couple of days ago and says he has this brilliant idea. We'll see where it goes. I don't know all the potential solutions that are out there and I don't see any combination of them making a significant difference except in the wrong direction. But I'd be more than happy to be wrong about that. So there's currently there is no solution in, with you engineering or any kind of techno fixes that yeah, out there right now. No, in fact, a, a report from the United States National Academy of Sciences from 2015 and also the same year from a European body of similar stature, they both concluded the same thing, both in 2015 that geoengineering is not likely to improve or or solve global warming, but in fact could make the situation a lot worse. So I don't know of anything that's out there. If it's out there, I'd love to know about it. And we, we better get cracking with its implementation very quickly. Oh yeah, it sounds like it should be at the top of the agenda. Right? <laughs> I can't imagine it's not. I mean, uh, you know, habitat for our species has got to be among the most important issues we've ever faced. Yeah. 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 That's so surprising. Um, my only concern with Extinction Rebellion, I've always thought of, you know, they do, they are about nonviolent activism. And I always think about it's very easy to, under the umbrella of nonviolence, to be creating violence. Because when you're out on the streets, it's very easy for, you know, people people, people hiding within hiding. all those hundreds and thousands of protesters actually doing violence, actually doing some, some major... And and I think about it, like if, if activists took all over the world, I don't think we would be... You know, we would probably be in a bigger mess than we are now. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, and not that, not that activism doesn't help. I know they got themselves to speak to the... Uh, governments and some of the some of the parliamentarians in the United Kingdom. So I guess they've got someone to listen. I don't know if they actually listen and have any propositions like you said. You don't have any text you're not yeah, if you're not giving out solutions then I don't know what the government's gonna do with really. you. So Right, well I, I think what the government can do at this point, and I think this is something no government would ever do, mm -hmm. is tell the truth. Governments do not exist to tell the truth. Yeah. Governments exist to channel money from the poor to the rich. That's the whole reason we have them, after all. So I agree with one of the principles of Extinction Rebellion, which is to get the governments to tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah, that's but I also think that's essentially impossible. You know, unless unless Extinction Rebellion goes in with flamethrowers and, and starts pulling toenails out of politicians, I don't think they're going to tell the truth. That hasn't been our history to date over the course of the last few thousand years. But maybe I'm just cynical. It's what I find conflicting I find as well. So I, I do want to be uh, hopeful that we will come out of this mess. Uh, but when I listen to some of the things you're saying, that we, there is no hope. You know, there is no way out. Um, and what do we tell our kids? What do we I have two little ones. What do I, what do I tell them? Do, do they have some right. hope or they don't? So. You tell them the truth. You distinguish between hope as wishful thinking and hope as what Joanna Macy calls active hope, hope with attendant action. And that's an important distinction because hope by definition is wishful thinking. Hope is wishing for a favorable outcome over which nobody, over which you have no control. So if that's your definition of hope, that you're just going to sit back and wait for something glorious to happen. Hope is basically the belief in a favorable future. Yeah. So that doesn't do anything. That doesn't do any good at all. And that's, that's just like capitulating to fear. I fear the future will be terrible. 
I hope the future will be good. I'm not going to do anything about it because I'm going to let other people deal with that part. That doesn't do any good. Active hope from the Joanna Macy's perspective and is, is rooted in action. Then we can be hopeful. If we are willing to take actions, then we might be able to accomplish something. But if, if we actually adhere to the definition of hope, I think it's a terrible idea. And that's why my latest peer-reviewed journal article, I'm just gonna flash it right here in your face here, yeah. It's called Becoming Hope Free. It's getting a little blurred, but I think I'll put up a link. I, I've, I've got this. Yeah, it's called Becoming Hope Free, right. Parallels Between Death of Individuals and Extinction of Homo Sapiens. And in the article, which appeared in Clinical Psychology Forum, I point out that 50 years ago, medical doctors lied to their patients so that they wouldn't destroy hope. Yeah. They lied. I would never suggest lying even in the name of hope. That's what Extinction Rebellion does. They lie by omission of the aerosol masking effect to give people hope. I don't want that kind of hope. Yeah. If, the, if that's the choice, then I want to be hope free. And apparently that's the choice. So, you know, I, I attract a lot of negative attention for my perspective on hope, but I've been attracting a lot of negative attention for a long time. It doesn't really bother me much anymore. <laughs> yeah, you warned me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to play yeah, the and, and, ag and again, I'm a huge fan of action. Yeah. But that seems to me to be contrary to hope. So right. I want to take relevant actions. With respect to abrupt climate change, I the the pursuit of relevant actions to me means conducting research and digging deep and trying to find what information is out there that might permit us to maintain habitat for maintain habitat for ourselves and other species for as long as possible but so far i've come up largely empty handed in that respect Planting the seeds of doubt. You know, this is what the tobacco companies did many years ago in the 1970s. They, they used various people to plant these seeds of doubt amongst the general populace. And as a result, a whole lot of people died because they were smoking cigarettes that the commercials were telling them was good for them. Yeah. Not just not bad for them, but good for them. And we see the same thing today. You only have to put a little seed of doubt into somebody's mind about climate change and they're not gonna change anything as a consequence. Right. And this is why I'm frequently accused of being employed by the Koch brothers or some other nonsense. Yeah. Because what I say in describing the aerosol masking effect as well as greenhouse gases is that those two cancel each other out and therefore reducing industrial activity, much less stopping it altogether, is a bad idea. And people who are not fully informed and who want people to take various actions collectively are not content with the full truth, are not content with providing all of the evidence. So they're planting those seeds of doubt. And I get this during almost every interview. Somebody says, an interviewer almost always asks, especially when, when they want to be combative, they almost always ask something like this. Okay, so you say that we're in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change and that we're going extinct. What other scientists agree with you? And I point out that the information I use comes from climate scientists. So no climate scientist could possibly disagree with the evidence I use because they produced the evidence. It wasn't me. I haven't been conducting primary research for more than a decade. 
So I'm not conducting that research. It's other people, so they can't disagree with that. And they, then they, then the interviewer asked, "Yes, but you add these things up. Who else is adding them up?" And I say, "Nobody. Unfortunately, sadly, nobody else is adding them up." Yeah. I don't want to be right about this, but when you look at the work of this person and this person and this person and this person, and you add that information together, to me, it points us towards a very unfavorable future. Nobody wants to hear that, including me. That doesn't make it wrong. Yeah. So it's a bummer. Yeah. It's a real bummer to me and to everybody I know. Yeah. That we, that we can no longer believe what's called the infinite growth paradigm. Yeah. The notion that we could have infinite growth on a finite planet, of course, makes no sense when you think about it for more than five seconds. Yeah. But then the conventional argument is, yeah, but we've been doing it so far. Yeah. Therefore, we must be able to keep it going. Yeah. No, yeah. no. At some point, the train stops. At some point, the train that has gone off the trestle and is headed for the canyon down below, at some point, it hits bottom. Yeah. And I think we can see the bottom now, and then, and we're still not doing anything about it. That's what's kind of surprising as well. Well, and I think that's because there's nothing at the level of society to be done. So we could reduce industrial activity, but that causes the increase in heating associated with the loss of the aerosol masking effect. We could remove greenhouse gases, but doing so causes uh, the removal of those aerosols. So I wish, I wish in my dreams you know, where I emperor for a day, we would tell the full truth to people and rely upon them to make the decisions they want to make. Have them reach closure in their relationships or create more robust relationships, more honest and more loving relationships. And so that's why I'm promoting the idea of planetary hospice is because I think we're there or very near there and what happens in a hospice? People are honest with each other. People stop lying to each other. And, and this entire culture is built on lies. So of course, people are gonna push back against that idea. Yeah. But when it comes to your individual relationships at the level of your family, the person you sleep with at night, the, the people you work with, your coworkers, your colleagues, and so forth, honesty seems like the first best step we can take. Why not expand that to the level of the globe? Is that too much to ask? To be honest for a change? Apparently it is. You know, you mentioned 450 <laughs> nuclear plants. I wanted to ask you about that. But what do you think? Well, firstly, do you think nuclear is a good alternative? Uh, or the only sort of viable alternative? <clears throat> and this is where I kind of reach. Kind of okay, it seems like maybe nuclear is the way to go, but then I, when I heard we talk about a few things, and I want to want to know your take on that. And if not nuclear, then what? You know. <clears throat> well, Three Mile Island was a warning, and Chernobyl was a warning, and Fukushima was a tremendous warning that is already causing the life the life of many many species, right. causing extinction of many species. And and if those weren't warnings enough then I don't know what is, you know, to think that we can take a technology that has the potential to cause our own extinction in what's called a zero infinity problem. Zero infinity is essentially a 0% chance of any nuclear power plant melting down. But when it does, the consequences are infinitely bad. Thus the zero infinity problem as it's called. And so far we've had Three Mile Island, which admittedly did not melt down, but Chernobyl that did, and Fukushima that did. So we have two zero probability events happening within my lifetime. Within, were they both within your lifetime? Yeah. So within the last 40 years or whatever it's been, we've had these two 0% probability events occur and the consequences have been infinitely bad, basically. 
<clears throat> so to think that we, you know, to have the hubris to think that we can harness the ahead and nothing could possibly go wrong with elements that have half-lives of tens of thousands of years, just to me, reeks of lack of wisdom. We are clever, we are not wise. What else is out there? Well, there's this thing called conservation, you know, to not demanding more and more and more of every single thing. There's, there's this notion that we don't have to have the lights come on every time we want the lights to come on. You know, there's this idea that if we want water to come out of the tap, we actually pump the water ourselves as humans did for the first 300,000 years of the species Homo sapiens. But, but here we are at this particular time in history when we have the most amazing technology. And I'm not just talking about eyeglasses here. I'm talking about smartphones with the computing power that would have filled in a, a gymnasium a, a generation ago. So we have all this amazing technology and incredible knowledge. And it's, it's amazing to be here at this time in history. And how have we used that information? How have we used the knowledge? How have we applied the technology? mostly without much foresight, mostly with the notion that Moore's law will always prevail, that things will constantly get better and the future is always going to be brighter than the future or the past. I'm sorry, the future will always be better than the, than the present or the past. So why not just slow down? Is that so anathema to this culture? Why not try to get by with less? Why not have fewer babies over time instead of more? But, you know, we've been receiving these messages since the 1960s from Paul Ehrlich and Garrett Hardin and other ecologists. And this was a notion I taught in every single one of the courses I taught on college campuses for 21 years, was more people might not be a better idea. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I chose when I was 19 years old to not have children because I could see it then in 1979. In 1979, I could see that adding more people to the mix is not going to improve any problem of any significance. And here we are, and there's twice as many people as there were then. And so the, I think there are a lot of things we could have done if, we, if only we had a time machine. You know, I, I think harnessing the atom was perhaps the worst thing that we did since harnessing fire. And doubling the human population every 10 minutes seems like a really bad idea, and I'm only exaggerating slightly there. <laughs> yeah. we've, we've taken a lot of missteps along the way. And for me, all of that, all of that just screams at me that life is short. Mine and yours and our species, as with every other species, ours will go extinct. As with every other life on Earth, our lives will end. How do we live in light of that, that information? How do we live? What are you going to do? These are the central questions I've been asking for decades since my time in the classroom. What are you going to do given this information that indicates nobody lives forever, including a species, the, the most intelligent species in the history of Earth is not gonna live forever. Yeah. How are you gonna live? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna pursue? So, I've been talking about these things for a long time. You're one of the few people who's listened. <laughs> I'm trying to live off of coffee, but I've also tried to be vegan for the longest time mm -hmm. now, but it's, are you vegan by any chance and what are you, take on veganism. Mm. I'm not vegan. Okay. I eat pretty low on the food chain. Uh, veganism, you, you know, I'm, I'm attacked constantly by almost everybody. You, you pick a demographic and somebody from that demographic has attacked me. 
whether it's a person of a certain age or a certain color or a certain dietary regime or pick anything at all, somebody has attacked me. Yeah. Vegans are the most common group of people to attack me. Oh, okay. Because I don't tell people that going vegan will save the earth. Well, of course it won't. In fact, veganism is a privilege of city dwelling people, period. Yeah. Veganism is a privilege. Veganism requires us to plow the earth. Veganism at anything resembling a large scale requires us to destroy the planet even faster than not being vegan does. Because you have to plow the planet. I, I can send you an article if you'd like, and, and you can include a link to it. Oh, yeah. Big, it, 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 I think it's from The Guardian. It's called Veganism Will Not Save the Planet or something like that. But I'll, I'll send okay. you the link as soon as we're done here. And basically, it points out that veganism depends upon these very negative industrial agricultural activities. And I suspect our species got in trouble when we started plowing the fields and planting the grain. In fact, that's the hallmark of every civilization so far is the ability and the willingness to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale. Before we started doing that, only somewhere around a few thousand years ago, we'll say less than 10,000 years ago. Before we started doing that, so in other words, for at least the first 300,000 years of Homo sapiens, we're about 315,000 years old now. So for the first 300,000 years, there was no such thing as civilization. How did civilizations arise? Well, civilizations first arose when coming out of the last ice age, the global average temperature increased a little bit and then stabilized. Stabilized at a very cool temperature, about one and a half degrees above the last ice age, one and a half degrees Celsius. And then that cool, constant temperature, that stable temperature allowed the ability to grow grains at scale. So suddenly, when there had been no previous version of civilization, we'll define civilization here as the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale, that had never happened before. And suddenly, there's civilizations popping up simultaneously all around the planet, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. As soon as the temperature increased a little bit above the previous ice age and then stabilized, so we had this nice stable temperature, suddenly we can grow grain. Now, and only now, do we have a set of living arrangements by which people can gather together in groups larger than a couple hundred, Dunbar's number. When that happens, somebody turns into an idiot and starts locking up the food. Somebody starts taking advantage of the power that comes from not everybody in the group being able to keep track of everybody else in the group. So we talked earlier about living in a small town, how everybody can keep an eye on everybody else. When that happens, there certainly is sociopathy and psychopathy in the genes at the same level as there is today. But those never arise. Why do they never arise? Because a sociopath is immediately exposed in a small town. They can't act on their sociopathy. They'll be banned from the town. They'll be denigrated. They will be insulted. They, that behavior is not appreciated when everybody knows everybody else. Yeah. But when you have 350 million people, then Donald Trump is the obvious outcome. Or any other form of government that allows for a few individuals to exert considerable influence over everybody, that's the obvious outcome of the ability, of the inability to keep track of everybody. Of course, then we have free riders. Yeah. Of course, then we have people who are doing things that they would never do to their family. If, if the whole village is your family, then you don't do certain things. If you grow beyond that village and nobody's keeping track of everybody else, then of course some idiot, some jerk is going to appear just for the ability to gain a you a little bit more privilege for a, for a little bit longer time. Sure. That's the very expected outcome of civilization is increased privilege for the few. So one of those outcomes, as it turns out, is veganism.
And that's a privilege okay. rewarded to a few. I have, I think it's, this is something I'll have to disagree with you, but I've also, but I want to read that article before you, <laughs> before I speak to you, or maybe not. Yeah. Of course, that makes sense on so many levels. Environmental, personal health. Yes. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of eating low on the food chain. And when I was growing all of my own food for a few years in New Mexico, when I moved off grid and started growing food and preserving that food, I ate very little meat. Because if the, if the meat that you're eating is something you killed and it used to be a friend of yours, a goat or a chicken or a duck, yeah. then you tend to eat a lot less meat than you otherwise would. And I have always eaten low on the food chain. And we have a very different culture than we did 50 years ago. 50 years ago in the United States, there were relatively, there were, there were farmers who were growing a lot of different crops and not everybody had meat on the plate every day. And now we have a significant reduced number of people growing the food and and you go into a large grocery store and there's just an aisle of meat that is just turns your stomach yeah it's a completely different experience than it was even when i was a kid and when i was a kid at least 99 percent of the meat i ate was something that came at the end of a hook or the end of a bullet from my family so I used to go fishing every day in the summertime, and that's what I ate for meat, was the fish I caught. Yeah. And the, the other meat we ate was the, the grouse or the pheasant or the deer or the elk that my dad and my mom shot. Yeah. Because this is what we did. We provided for our own food. We couldn't afford beef at the store. I, I bet I didn't eat beef 30 times until I went to college. And it's a very different experience. Again, when you're providing for your own food, as we were when I was a kid, we'd go out and hunt that, hunt or fish for that food. You tend to eat a lot less meat than if you can go to the grocery store and, and ground beef is a buck sixty nine a pound or whatever it costs. You know, it's incredibly well subsidized food system now, yes. so that we're all encouraged to consume food that is bad for us. Yeah. So it's all about the money. <laughs> the subsidies are all going in the wrong direction. They have been at least since World War II, probably before then. Yeah. You know, and when it's when it's inexpensive for most people to eat steak, then most people are going to eat steak. Yeah. That's true. And I haven't had a steak for a really long time. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I buy, I mean, I haven't eaten meat in four years, but I still buy eggs because they're really cheap. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the cheapest source of protein that I can put on the table, you know, for me and the kids. So, right. And, you know, one of the messages I'm trying to portray is that there's more than one way to live. And... And this whole set of living arrangements in which we are embedded currently is not the only way to live. And veganism is not the only way to live. And vegetarian is not the only way to live. And carnivore is not the only way to live. And going to school full time is not the only, I mean, there's, but most of us, our, our identity becomes who we are. If I am a professor of conservation biology, then, I become that image of myself and I become addicted to promoting this idea of me as this egoistic being. And, and I think we're all guilty of that at some level. You know, teacher, we, we call teachers teachers with some indication of their nobility, with some respect. And so teachers want people to know that they're teachers, just like everybody who ever went to the University of California at Berkeley tells everybody they meet within 10 seconds of meeting them that they went to the University of California at Berkeley because it's a prestigious place to go. So vegans have their identity. We all have our identities. Yeah. And 
And, and to get rid of that identity in Buddhism is to kill the Buddha, right? And so being too attached to that notion of ourselves, of our own ego, is a bad idea. And we're all inclined to go down that road. There is no right. Well, at least there's no absolute right. There's a lot of wrong. Yeah. We identify that readily. <laughs> You know, there's, you, before civilizations arose, just a relatively few thousand years ago, there were a whole bunch of different ways that people lived. There were hunter-gatherers, there were mostly gatherer-hunters. There were a lot of people who moved from one place to another, who migrated throughout the year or years. And there were people who learned how to grow food, and they were very, very careful about it, about the way they grew the food and the way they prepared the food. Because if you don't have access to the internet, something you do to that food can kill you or your children. So you're going to be pretty careful about it. So things proceeded relatively slowly. That's not the case anymore. Things are going at the speed of life now. And the speed of life is very fast. Oh, you've shifted my you've shifted my perspective now. <laughs> I'm, you know? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been following this guy called Ed Winters, and he's so very pro. He's obviously a vegan, turned vegan, and he had a TED talk, and he's a very very inspiring speaker, very factual with whatever he states. And it's, uh, but like I said, like I don't, I'm never able to a hundred percent commit to anyone. You know. Uh, and I always find that we, this is how we need, I think this is the approach that we so perhaps like you, like you said, you're, maybe we should all be sort of critical of everything we, we hear and, and see in our lives, especially now with all the cherry picking and all going on. Right. Uh, and I think, Except each other. Let's not yes. so be, be so critical to each other. Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. you want to be vegan? Fine. You have my blessing for whatever that's worth. I love vegans. I love vegetarians. I love yeah. people who eat meat. I, you know, yeah. we don't have to insult people because of what they do or do not eat. Let's practice a little humility for a change and not assume that the way I do things is the way everybody should do things. Whether that comes to my dietary, dietary sources or the brand of laptop I'm sitting here using right now or whatever. Yeah. I think you have covered those topics. Like, I actually wanted to understand what is climate forcing and what is non-linear increase mean when it when it comes to you know a lot of things. But let me let me touch base with you again because I think I've taken. That'd be lot fine of because now. if somebody sees this as longer than an hour, they're not even going to listen. They're like, I don't have an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we can break this up into segments. That'd be yeah. great. We can no, talk about I'm, anything. But I'm happy that you you you, know, you were willing to give me your time and. Um, and share all your insights and, and and shift my perspective in some ways as well. <laughs> well, that's good. That's what education is about. Yes. Education is not about those details that sh that you want to learn. I mean, it's about those too. It's about forcing. It's about the greenhouse effect. It's it's about global dimming. It's about all those things too. But really, if it works, it's about shifting your perspective. It's about changing the way you think and therefore the way you live. So thank you for the opportunity to have the conversation. I appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you so much. What's the last line you say always? I love that when you say at the end of... Please. At the edge of extinction, only love remains. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to sign off, yeah.